All right, let's, let's get going. So um, I'm delighted to uh, be here to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, uh, Jennifer Rubin. Jennifer, as you probably know, writes the Right Turn blog for the Washington Post, which um, offers a bracing and stimulating mix of reporting and opinion from a conservative point of view on an absolutely dizzying array of, um, of topics. As I was scrolling through some of her recent posts um, in, in preparation for introducing her, it made me tired just reading through them. Um, just in the last week, and I haven't even checked in the last 36 hours or so, she's posted about the president's family business and his conflicts of interest, um, ethical lapses at the EPA, tariffs, tax cuts, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook and data privacy, among um, many other things, and God only knows what's happened in the last couple of hours that I haven't been tracking. Um, uh, she also seems to be adept at um, what I might, what you might call orthopedic diagnosis. Uh, she wrote uh, just earlier this week, now would be a good time for Republicans to find their spines. Um, she's been uh, relentless and intelligent in holding those in power to a consistent and uh, principled set of standards of rhetoric and behavior. Um, and in pointing out where and how they fall short, um, a stance that um, I, well, I should say has brought her a fair bit of uh, notoriety and criticism uh, from others on the right, um, um, and that, we, as we were just talking, has put her in an interesting position, um, um, but that I think has made her really indispensable reading for many of us who are trying uh, to get a complete view of the unfolding drama of American democracy. Um, Jennifer came to the Post after stints at Commentary and the Weekly Standard, among other publications. Uh, she came to journalism after a first career uh, practicing law um, in Los Angeles, I understand. I'm not sure which of those facts is more unfortunate. Um, we, should, uh, um, we should be very glad, I think, though, that her professional journey uh, brought her to journalism and to Washington, uh, and we're especially delighted that that journey includes a stop with us this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Rubin. Thank you, and thank you to New America, to Columbia, to all of you for coming out on what seems to be the first day of spring in Washington, D.C., a little bit late. Uh, in preparation for this, um, and I guess it's, uh, I would say it's a coincidence, but something like this happens just about every week. Um, Freedom House released its annual report on what it calls consolidating democracies. These are primarily in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, um, most of them being post-Soviet uh, era, uh, now independent states. And they've been tracking the progress and the development. And I'd just like to briefly read something from their findings. The consolidation of democratic institutions in the post-communist countries of Europe that occurred in the late 1990s and early 2000s has stalled, and in important cases has been reversed. The democracy score of every country in Central Europe has declined since 2008, with the biggest setbacks in media, judiciary, and the functioning of national democratic institutions like parliaments and presidencies. And that, I think, is where we find ourselves. Um, whatever uh, one may think of President Trump, and we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure, um, we are facing a worldwide phenomenon, a crisis of democracy. And in speaking to scholars, to Europeans, to Americans, um, I don't think um, there is much of a mystery anymore as to how we got here in general. There perhaps may be a mystery as to how we got here in the United States, but I think the road to democratic crisis has been uh, relatively obvious in retrospect, at least. Um, certainly, the promise of liberal democracies to bring prosperity to the broad cross-section of their populations has not been fulfilled, at least not been fulfilled to the degree to which it was anticipated or desired. Globalization, uh, of which um, I am both an observer because it is reality and an advocate because uh, through international institutions and democratic capitalism, we've lifted a couple billion people out of poverty. It has also had um, a deleterious effect on certain groups in a wide array of industrial countries. But I don't think, um, and in this I agree with Bill Galston from Brookings, who is out with a wonderful new book um, very much on this topic. 
I do agree with him that if it were purely an issue of economic stagnation, a failure to increase productivity and therefore increase wages, that we would be in the place that we are in. There is some other component of this. And he identifies it as being the immigration issue. Certainly in Europe, the introduction of really millions of people from war-torn countries in the Middle East um, set off a series of events and sparked a revival of the National Front and other right-wing parties. Certainly Donald Trump in this country has used the immigration issue to an enormous extent, um, almost um, solely, I think, now um, when the going gets tough, he returns to the immigration issue. But is it simply immigration? Is it simply the introduction of a greater diversity in Western democracies that has upset the apple cart? And I would say it's a little bit different. That's part of it, but not entirely. And I think the more accurate analysis that really does apply to Europe, to the United States, um, is this balance between a closed society, a traditional set of values and mores well-rooted in rural regions, and the rocky transition and the promise of the digital age and an open society with um, open ideas and a great diversity of views. And I think the strains on that, if you look at rural America versus the productive areas of large cities, if you look at the map of where Brexit voted, if you look at, um, for example, where the National Front did well and where it didn't do well, you will see this divide between agrarian, more religious societies and less religious, more urban, more diverse societies primarily located in the cities and the suburbs. And I think that's a worldwide phenomenon. It is a function of, uh, to some degree, the globalization. But it has also created, um, and it's not the first time you've heard this, created two societies that don't much interact with one another. And I would say that uh, in addition to looking at the current commentary, I go back time and again uh, to Putnam's book, The Great Sort. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's basically an analysis that we have polarized politics, we have polarization because we have polarized ourselves. We have sorted ourselves uh, with a remarkable clarity, remarkable precision in coastal elites, urban elites, um, to the sides, uh, less uh, educated, more religious people, more conservative socially um, in the middle. And you can see it even within states. Um, any of you guys from California? I know one person is from California here. Um, any of you from California? Well, if you know California, if you've been to California, if you lived in California, you know it's even within one state. There is a ribbon along the coast of the Pacific that is what everyone thinks of California, a blue America at its finest, the most diverse, the most progressive, um, leading the way in the digital age. But the other California is Red California, which geographically is bigger, not so many people there, which is another problem. Um, but that is, has the same division that you see in the rest of the country. And I think if you would go state by state in the United States, you would find the same tension and the same division. So what happens when we have sorted ourselves, when we have this huge tension between two groups of peoples? Uh, how does it all kind of work its way out? And why did we wind up in this age of nativist, protectionist, really racist populism? How, how did that fit the, the niche? Um, and I go back to a few origins of the problem. Um, and uh, I want to also stress that in analyzing how we got here, I am peculiarly optimistic about how we get ourselves out the other end. I think it is plainly the case that Western democracies ceased to self-advertise and ceased to convey the benefits of democracy to subsequent generations. We had a, pardon the phrase, a, a, a holiday from history in the Cold War and World War II where civic culture and civic responsibility was perhaps at its peak in American life. 
people understood um, what it meant to have a constitutional government, maybe not in precise terms that the Supreme Court would analyze it, but there was a good sense of what our public institutions did, what individuals' responsibilities were, and if you will, a civic virtue, um, a culture of respect, a culture of, um, if you will, dignity of our public leaders. And that held for a while. And then through the 60s, through the 70s, that eroded. And when we need it the most, when we need civic culture, and I don't mean a homogenized, bland culture, but when we need a ethic of democracy, when we need a um, bellwether, it is very deficient right now. Um, it's deficient in schools. It's deficient in our public leaders. It's deficient in the sets of incentives we have set for who goes into public life. Um, and uh, I've had a little bit of an evolution on campaign finance reform because of this. Um, but it is, um, I think, this collision of um, a negligence by democratic leadership and a pulling apart these centrifugal forces that we need it more than ever. And as I said, optimistically, um, I think we are capable of a society of some reverse engineering. And there is some wonderful work being done in the private sector, which Hewlett Packard, for example, is, uh, plays a great role, the Madison Group, um, in which uh, there are a number of people who are trying to figure out how do we reinstill a sense of civic virtue, of civic participation. Um, I would very much commend, I think it's still online, so you can probably get it, Condoleezza Rice um, and uh, David Johnson at Stanford have done a wonderful program for PBS, runs about 90 minutes, called The American Creed. And that is exactly what this is about. It's exactly about the need to rediscover and reinforce a set of civic virtues and a sense of um, unification. Um, as a conservative, I have always believed that America is a creedal country. Um, all men are created equal, and that race and gender and every other division um, is irrelevant in your definition of what it means to be an American. That view, which I thought was self-evident, and I'm sure all of you thought was self-evident, is very much not self-evident. And that's, I think, part of the way we pull ourselves back out of this. I also think that um, for better or worse, um, the media and the media environment in which we find ourselves is particularly conducive to demagogues and right-wing populist leaders. It's hard to seize a chunk of the electorate, I'll be talking about America for a moment, um, when you have three large networks, this behemoths that broadcast to everyone, and more or less, everyone is getting the same facts, the same news. There is a unifying effect. And remember, it was such a big deal when people discovered that there was something called a uniform dialect, that television was so pervasive that we were creating a whole new speech pattern, which was essentially the Midwestern, what we think of as bland, but um, the, the whole speak of TV network news. That was one indication of many about how we, in essence, again, reinforced a civic culture through a finite number of outlets. That is, to my kids, um, as old as you know, buggies and um, you know, lamplighters out on the street. Um, that is an era gone by. And we have fragmented. We have removed all barriers. Um, if any of you saw um, parts of Mr. Zuckerberg's uh, testimony this week, um, you could see how easily that is captured and used. Um, and so the tools for people to exploit these divisions are more plentiful and free than at any time, I think, in our recent history. So I think the media environment has a huge amount to do with this. Um, Third, I would say that, at least in the United States, the particular structures that we developed in order to prevent tyranny, in order to prevent the accumulation of power, 
have led to a paralysis that has really infuriated a great number of Americans. We are designed, the Senate specifically, of course, to not move fast. Um, we are designed to um, spread power um, among the branches of the federal government and from the federal government down to local government. You combine that with extreme polarization in the electorate, which is then reflected in the extreme polarization of our elected representatives, and you have absolute gridlock. And whether you agreed with his solution or not, when Donald Trump made the case that America is broken, that American government is broken, that it, does, it is non-responsive, it doesn't do what the people want it to do, he struck a chord not only with his white working class, non-college educated voters, but with a lot of Americans because there is this sense that something is terribly broken. And how did he get this broken? Again, that's another two hour talk. Um, but part of it has to do with the way in which we finance our politics. Part of it has to do with the erosion of political parties as a sorting and moderating influence on our political system. But I think it's fair to say that right now, the gridlock that we experience, the failure to do the people's business, the failure to reflect what sometimes may be a opinion or a viewpoint or desire that's held by 90% of the American people, I refer to the gun issue, is somehow not translated into any results. And there is a frustration with democracy. There is a sense that it doesn't work. And when someone comes along to tell you, I've got this, I alone can do this, there is a temptation to say, why not? Why not throw it all away and try something new because this isn't working? Again, let's reverse engineer that a little bit. Do we have problems with our political system? Absolutely. Are there solutions that we could come up with that would help reduce this frustration, reduce gridlock? Absolutely. People are a lot smarter than I are coming up with a slew of innovations, everything from voting on Sundays to jungle-style primaries to um, all sorts of campaign uh, ideas to re-engaging on Remember the dreaded um, process of pork barreling um, and the uh, marks that the uh, political leadership used to use in order to um, hold their people's feet to the fire. There's a whole range of issues, which I'll call reforms of the democratic process, that I think are designed not to promote urgent action and not to promote one outcome or another outcome but to sort of unlock the gears so that there is a better representation of popular opinion and a path towards some resolution of some of the issues that confront us. It's going to be a long time before we figure this out if we do at all. And I think ironically, what has given this a little bit of a jump start and what has perhaps brought us to a point where we could envision some unlocking. You can see the ice breaking and the, um, the ice flows uh, separating is Donald Trump himself. And I can attest to that personally, having been on a political journey of the last year or so, um, that there is, I think, a resurgence of a good government, if you will, it's gotten a bad name of the goo goo government folks, but of well-meaning, concerned center left to center right people who are genuinely afraid for the well-being of our country, who are genuinely aghast at um, our current president, and who understand we've got to get in the game and we've got to fix the architecture of our society before we could get back to arguing about the top marginal tax rate and how much government it we really want and what health system should we really have. That if we don't get the big issues of shoring up democracy, modernizing, updating, lubricating the gears, that we're going to be in a heap of trouble. And I think the irony of Donald Trump is that he has also, I think, provided or shown the way to get ourselves out of the fix that we were in. 
or partially get ourselves out of the fix. I am ironically and perversely extremely optimistic as I stand here today. Why? Because we have millennials voting in numbers that are off the charts in an off-year election. We're, we're not in a presidential year. And not around a single cultist figure, but around issues that are very value-laden. Um, when you hear them speak about Me Too, when you hear them speak about environmentalism, the gun issues, these are issues that go beyond a policy prescription and are really value-laden expressions of their uh, mindset. It is the most diverse, it is the largest generation to come along, and one can't but look at their display of participatory democracy and not be somewhat reassured that People do care. They care enough to defend democracy. So I think in the, all levels of um, democratic participation, which I think it's fair to say has kind of eroded over time, whether it's number of candidates running, number of women running, number of people turning out in off-year elections. Uh, in my home state of Virginia, was, again, was off the charts last year. Um, and all of these indications in people subscribing to newspapers as an act of political defiance. I don't know how many emails I get a week. Keep it coming, guys. Um, that people say, you know, I felt like after Donald Trump was elected, I had to support the press. What a fabulous way of, you know, um, fighting back, as, as I can attest. Um, so I think in all these ways, big and small, we are seeing a resurgence of participatory democracy. Marches in the street people donating to groups that are challenging Trump um, in courts every day, in terms of people running for office, and in terms of, I think, what has been a national revulsion, it is fair to say, um, against a leader who does not embody the values, the norms, the perspectives that we have trusted our presence of both parties to exhibit over the long haul. Now, I want to focus for just a minute, and I'll promise leave plenty of time for questions, um, but I want to focus a little bit on these issues surrounding the rule of law. And I raise it for two reasons. One, as we stand here today, no one really knows unless they're checking their phone whether Mr. Mueller is still there and Mr. Rosenstein is still there. Um, but secondly, because I think the rule of law plays a disproportionate, a hugely disproportionate role in writing the ship. Um, when we look at the federal courts that have struck down now, I think we're on three or four, I've lost track of the Muslim travel bans. When we look at courts have struck down um, the so-called sanctuary cities, which is a term that has no meaning, um, efforts for the federal government to intrude on local law enforcement and regulate how they interact um, with immigration control uh, personnel. When you look at the number of um, participants, a guy brief, um, that challenged just about every attempt to aggrandize power from Mr. Trump, whether it is people writing to courts to say, you know, Sheriff Joe might have gotten a pardon, but we should really think about the pardon process very carefully. Actions like that, all the way to actions challenging all of these issues, to challenging um, each of the environmental provisions, not necessarily on the basis of merit, but on the basis that he has not followed the constitutional process. There is a process in our country for repealing regulations. There is a framework that designates a certain role, but not more for the president in the execution of immigration policy. And it is that architecture that I think is crucial, not only because it provides a safety net for the country, but because it allows people to see that democracy uniquely, um, and in this case I use democracy very loosely. Um, societies built around the rule of law, so open societies that have uh, an independent judiciary, is a tremendous safety hatch. And I think that, in part, is why people are so alarmed and are on pins and needles about the progress of the special prosecutor. I guess we have another prosecutor up in New York who is now involved. 
And why, I think, for me as an American, me as a conservative, I take such strong exception to the effort to demonize what is the lawful operation, the nonpartisan operation of our criminal justice system, whether it's in the process of obtaining warrants to surveil people or it is the process of approving a no-knock search of a lawyer's office. This is being done by the book. And I think you both have to admire it and fear for an attack on it. And I think to a certain degree, we've managed even to alarm Republicans who are now for the first time considering a piece of legislation, may not be the right, may not be complete, but anything, something that would insulate Mr. Mueller from partisan meddling and termination. It's the effort in some cases that really does count. And I think it is this legal architecture that ultimately will prevail. It's funny, the lifetime appointment of a federal judge is a wonderful thing. Um, pretty soon they learn to be ingrates. Pretty soon they forget and we forget who appointed them. And they realize that in their hands is a tremendous power. Many conservatives, me included in the past, have been a little bit too concerned about how much power was left in the courts and what issues were resolved there as opposed to in the democratic process. But in this case where it's all about process, it's all about following the rules, going by the book, adhering to the Administrative Law Act, adhering to separation of powers, it is a tremendous benefit that we have. Um, and I have spoken somewhat critically actually to our friends at the American Bar Association about their responsibility to speak up. When the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided that the hugely gerrymandered uh, congressional lines did not meet the Pennsylvania Constitution, um, smartly putting it there as opposed to on uh, a federal terms, there were lawmakers, including their United States Senator, who called to impeach those judges. It's up to the bar, it's up to practitioners, it's up to other politicians to say, no, we don't do that. This is what the guarantee of an independent judiciary provides to us. So I'll wrap up my semi-prepared <laughs> remarks um, on this note, that I don't want to minimize the dangers of this right-wing populist movement. We're frankly looking at a situation in which a echo of the Warsaw Pact could be re-emerging. We may be in another few years back to a situation in which Eastern and Central Europe identifies more with Russia than with the United States. That is cataclysmic. We could be in a position, in fact, where the president does take some outlandish action and winds up pardoning himself, his friends, his family, and uh, defying all legal structures. So I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. But I also think it behooves those of us who study this and who root for democracy not to become fatalistic, not to be defeatist about this, and to see that the shoots, the green shoots of democracy are popping up, that we have institutional protections that are under attack but have endured, whether it's the free press, whether it's the courts, and that there is a, I think, renewed sensibility, a renewed interest in constitutional government and free democracies. Anytime we are having a debate about the constitutionality of anything, I think that is a great day for democracy. To have ordinary people arguing about the extent of the president's power to regulate immigration, that's what's going to save us. That's what's going to, in the long run, preserve the system that we have. So with that cheery perspective on dim times, um, I'll uh, be happy to take some questions. I think uh, our host is going to kind of collect them and then see if we can thematically group them. Great. Okay, thank you so much. That was terrific. So we do have um, we do have plenty of time for questions. So as Jennifer said, we'll take a round 
um, bring it back up here, and we'll go back and forth as for as long as we have. So let's start in the back with Lee. Good government interests and political process reforms. I'm curious what you think are the most promising political process reforms. I'm sorry? I'm what curious what you think are the most promising, sorry, oh, yeah. what you think are the most promising political process reforms right. that are building um, up. I tend to think that any effort that discourages polarization in the political parties is a good thing. Um, I think we have perhaps put a little too much faith in getting rid of gerrymandering to address this problem. Although I think we're very fortunate to have now two cases before the Supreme Court which are going to address gerrymandering. But gerrymandering and eliminating gerrymandering is a partial solution in part because of the great sort. Because even if you drew little boxes in California, you'd still have very blue and very red um, representatives. So, but I do think, um, jungle primaries, which essentially say everybody is into the primary and you take the top two. So there's an emphasis and an incentive to appeal to the middle. I think efforts to strengthen the political parties. Um, I would be very much in favor of trying to um, cleverly root some of the campaign cash that we have there back to the parties so that at least it goes through some institution that sorts. I think um, it is possible, although not in the short run, um, that we can um, revisit and perhaps reinstate. I think it would be a good idea. Um, of all things, a very anti-democratic um, convention, but one which has a perverse way of assisting democracy, and that is the Senate filibuster. The Senate filibuster makes appointees get support from the other party. Um, I am very concerned about a federal judiciary that can be elected purely on the votes of one party. That's going to have tremendous implications down the road. And I think um, if the parties could come out of their days and say, all right, we'll change the rules back to the way they were five years from today. We don't know who's going to be in power. That would be a good thing, too. Um, I think a lot of what we were also talking about is um, a change in normative behavior. All of us, me included, took a tremendous amount for granted when it came to our political leaders. I had plenty of differences with President Obama, but he did not defy legal norms. He did not assault the sensibilities of uh, Americans as a diverse um, people who had a creedal heritage. He did not. Uh, demagogue immigrants. He did not do a whole slew of things. He did not attack in American institutions. And I think the entire campaign and the entire process of electing leaders is due for an update. And the sorts of things we care about, the sorts of campaigns we construct, and the criteria by which we look at our leaders needs to change and I suspect will change in large part. And I think democracies, yes, they have a huge number of, as we've just talked about, protections and reinforcements. But who you elect and why you elect them matters a tremendous amount. And I am encouraged, frankly, by what I hear, at least in terms of the pre-pre-entry into the 2020 campaign from many Democrats who are going back to these issues of democracy, of democratic institutions, of the rule of law. And I hope it keeps up. I hope that, I hope that it's on that ground that we hold a election. Um, there is no great fix. And I would also um, say that for my liberal friends, I hope they now appreciate the value of federalism. Because federalism, you know, listen, we've all changed. We've all, you know, seen the other side. Um, federalism is a tremendous benefit. And to have the mayors and governors that we do around the country, who are some of the best, frankly, that we've had in many of these areas, defend their turf is another way in which we devise and preserve a 
democratic framework. And suddenly, the most important job in America may be a state attorney general, because those are the people who file suit. Those are the people who try to push back on the intrusion of the federal government. And that it's coming from the left rather than from the right just delights me. Um, so I think some combination of all those things um, are the sorts of things that we would be looking at. I don't think Citizens United is for forever. And by its own terms, the court indicated that it would be amenable to hearing about issues of corruption. Um, so I think we have a lot of avenues um, to pursue. But nothing really takes the place of putting people who care about democracy in positions of leadership. OK, I'm building a list. So let's, um, let's uh, go in order. So Kristen. Thank you for your comments. And as a, as a, de a denizen of this area, I really appreciate reading your columns. Um, I am fascinated by the never Trump conservatives. Uh, there seems to be a big group of them coming out of the foreign policy world and then maybe a smaller group coming out of kind of political consulting and Bush administration era political people. Um, so sort of a twofold but related set of questions. One, um, how, did how, how did never Trump conservatives sort of resist the pull of tribalism that seems to have taken over the rest of the Republican or large parts of the Republican Party. And second, should we think of people like you and Max Boot and others as um, politically courageous? I mean, is, it, is, it, is this an act of, in all seriousness, are people who are doing this, doing it for the good of the country and enduring social penalties, potentially professional penalties? I'm, I'm just actually really curious about this world. Right, right. Okay, let's, let's collect a few before we right. come back. Yeah, uh, you and the, the gentleman in the, at the center table. Uh, thank you for your, for your comments today. Um, being from Southern California, I do have to say that that blue ribbon isn't continuous. It is broken in the stronghold of red Orange County. So, But tending more blue, actually. <laughs> it is, actually. Tending more blue. <laughs> um, I want to just bring up a quick question in, concerning sanctuary cities. You said it's a, ter pardon me, a term that has no meaning. And my understanding probably is that you're referencing that off like your legal background. Um, but how do you respond to this when you stated just a minute ago that you defend the mayors that support sanctuary cities? So. Good question. Okay, so let's have uh, Ken and then, um, then Jennifer, and then I've got Tom and Theta in the next round. My question builds off what the other question that was just asked. It has more to do with, uh, con with respect to the, the never Trumpers, but what is. What role do they have to play going forward in the Republican Party? Um, when I, you know, we talked, we've talked a little bit yesterday. There's good, I think, more discussion today about the nature of the changes that are underway within the Republican Party. And is this now Donald Trump's political party, or is there still significant space uh, for those who maintain, you know, the kinds of a vision that you laid out with, within the Republican Party. Good. Okay, so a range of questions about the never Trump conservatives and the Republican Party, and then a set of questions about right. sanctuary cities and let me, let me take the sanctuary city issue because it's a little bit more discreet. Um, we do have a constitutional system, and it does not give the federal government the power to either in, uh, I don't know, sort of take over um, control local law enforcement. They do not have the power for the Justice Department to call up a local police chief and say, this is how you're going to run your department. This is what you've got to do. We have a FBI, as we all know, to deal with interstate issues and issues of federal law. But matters of local policing have always been within the jurisdiction of local law enforcement, except, and this is a huge exception, when it involves fundamental civil liberties and constitutional rights, um, implicating a federal issue. The notion that the federal government should force local law enforcement to reprioritize their policing, to say, no, I think it's more important that we arrange for the deportation of someone who has committed a non-violent crime 
That's more important than getting the cooperation of an entire community to be witnesses, to be um, on the lookout for crime, to be uh, cooperative with the police. The notion that we should allow that to happen through edict from the federal government is the antithesis of federalism. Um, it is also the case um, that the president doesn't really have these tremendous powers to rearrange our immigration law on his own. It's actually a law. There's actually a bill that was passed by Congress. Congress has the power to amend that or to repeal that. The Obligation of the president, of course, is to execute the laws and to, within the contours of existing legislation, promulgate regulations. The courts that have struck these down um, have ruled on both the grounds I just outlined. Federalism grounds, as well as executive overreach, separation of powers. The opinions are really some of the best guides, not only on that issue, but on the uh, Muslim ban that if you want to give yourself sort of a mini course in constitutional law, a little kind of tour around the Constitution, they're hugely helpful and hugely enlightening. You can kind of skip past all those citations and all that kind of stuff. But the issues that they are dealing with, the limited powers of the executive, the division of power between local governments and the federal governments are what I think is at the core of this issue. I would also say that this is an issue in which non-legal norms come into play. The lie, and there's, that's the only way I can phrase it, that we are in the midst of a crime wave generated by illegal aliens is complete and utter nonsense. We are at a relative low compared to crime figures from 20 or 30 years ago. And there is zero. And in fact, I know there's zero because I called up the Justice Department and asked them, what evidence is there that any increase in crime in any category is attributable to immigrants or illegal immigrants? There is no such evidence. And so I also look at this as a normative problem. Should we allow an administration to make up facts, to demagogue an issue, to isolate a group of people and attribute negative attributions to them, negative attributes to them. And if you find that creepily similar to some of what these right-wing parties in Europe advocate, I think you're actually on the right track. So let me go back to never Trumpers. <laughs> um, we are a strange bunch, aren't we? Um, you know, I think um, when I'm asked this question, um, my first impulse is to say, it's not weird that we have never Trumpers. It's weird that an entire party casts off years of belief and norms and understandings and decided to follow the great leader. There's a great portion of the Washington Post ABC poll today that looks at whether a, I think it's that poll, maybe an NBC poll, but it looks at whether pers the president's sexual life, private life, should be a disqualifying factor. When President Clinton was in office, Republicans by about 75 to 25% said yes. What do you think the poll number is now? <laughs> I don't even have to tell you and you know what the answer is. Um, this is more than hypocrisy. This is an abandonment of principles. And I think those of us who have stood apart from our party of birth, if, if it was a birth, have a few characteristics um, which made us perhaps peculiarly sympathetic um, to the opposition against Donald Trump and very much alert very early on to what this was going about. First of all, many of these people started off life as Democrats, and they are the so-called neocons or neoconservatives who left the Democratic Party in the 1960s and 70s because it was insufficiently bold, if you will, in confronting the Soviet Union. 
So it's not as if these people, me included, have some kind of birthmark of republicanism on them. You know, every 40 or 50 years, we have to leave the party that we're in. And I think it is um, not a coincidence that people who move parties for purely ideological reasons, as opposed to um, a history or a loyalty that goes by family or goes by um, region, were the first to jump off the Trump train or to never jump on and to put their hands up um, to stop them. It's a particular sort of politics that I think um, is principled, that is driven by just some fundamental core beliefs about what is America and how we're structured. I also think, um, and it's not been unnoted, that a very large number of the public uh, face, if you will, of the Never Trump movement is Jewish. Why is that? I think you couldn't listen in the 2016 campaign to Trump's language and his rhetoric and not make a personal historic flashback to Europe of the 1930s. And the same is true, by the way, that's not a Jewish thing, the same is true of Mormons, another persecuted religious minority. That people who have a historical gut level fear of racial or religious or ethnic demagoguery and who understand that their survival, literally, their survival depends upon the rule of law, upon democratic norms, are particularly sensitive when someone comes around, along and threatens to wipe it all away and to boot invokes immigration and xenophobia as a, uh, as a line in the sand. I also think it's a mystery in some sense why one person goes one way and another person goes the other. Believe me, I thought about this a lot um, in the uh, people who now think I'm you know, the devil. I got an uh, email the other day that said I was the serpent's mouth. I thought that was so poetic. Um, um, there are, um, a lot of this is simply personal choice and sensibility and a way of approaching politics or a way of looking at politics. The interesting question, I think, is yours, which is, so what? <laughs> are, are we going to save the Republican Party? And there is a difference of opinion. Um, my good friend and fellow Never Trumper, Bill Kristol, strongly believes that the Republican Party is rescuable, that they can throw out Donald Trump, they can elect new people, they can have a moment of, I don't know, uh, like the South Af African or the Chilean, you know, sort of confessional um, processes for um, ameliorating the divides in society, and they will resume and we will have our same two-party system back and running. I wish that were true. I really <laughs> do. Um, and yet, I don't know about that. I think... Um, in abandoning whatever their definition of conservatism was for right-wing populism, they personally, as well as institutionally, have crossed a line that many of us think is incompatible with democracy, incompatible with America as a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-gendered um, and uh, multi-everything um, society. I think um, on a personal level, I would not trust these people again. And I mean that on a personal level. Um, the people who participate in this, um, I would not trust with power again. Now, institutionally, um, what does that mean? If the Republican Party shrivels or they lose enough Jennifer Rubens and Max Boots and Bill Crystals that it's already a minority party, but it goes down even further so that they're unelected, unelectable. What does that mean? Um, I think several things are possible, um, neither of which is hugely likely, so I'm not sure what is going to happen is the answer. But one possibility is that the Democrats get it right, that they plant themselves in the center left, not at the socialist left or however you want to describe it, 
and they say, we're going to disagree with you, Jennifer, on you know, just how high that marginal tax rate is. But we're not crazies. We understand the need for a strong defense. We understand we are a market-based economy. Come on over and test the waters. In other words, it is possible that the, um, if you will, sort of the, the New Deal coalition of sort of everybody but the evangelical right can kind of band together and within that party work out most of the debates, most of the policy issues. I look at the Democratic Party right now, other people are more expert than I, and it doesn't seem that that's really where the energy is. Um, it seems like it is on the, the farther left reaches. Um, and I hope in their process, in their nominating process, they are able to think through this and work this out and think not only how they're going to win a nomination, but how they're going to win an election, and more importantly, how they are going to govern. And I think that's going to be the most fascinating part of 2020. The other possibility is we have the arrival of a new party. Um, third parties don't usually work in America, let's be honest. Um, in fact, they do very poorly. But what other rules of American politics have not been broken in the last <laughs> two years? So why not? Why, is it so impossible to imagine that in a wipeout year, let's say, for instance, that Republicans lose 60 seats in the House, and they actually manage to lose the Senate. A bunch of governorships go um, the other way to the Democrats. Is it so inconceivable that a John Kasich could say, I'm running as the new Republic Party, or the new America Party, um, and uh, come, come join me? I don't think it's impossible to imagine that. Um, and you know, the old adage, the Whigs didn't last forever. They went down. The Republican Party was born, um, interestingly enough, on the issue of race. Um, and so that is possible as well, that you have sort of a passing of the baton that the Republicans manage to marginalize themselves to such an extent that they become, in essence, the third party. It's really hard to think about how you get from here to there, except over a very long period of time. But it is theoretically possible. So I think the answer is we're all going to have to wait and see how it comes out. Um, and that's what makes these midterms so much more important than any other midterms. Because we're deciding, in essence, not only who's going to control Congress, is there going to be a Congress that's sympathetic to impeachment or non-impeachment, we're kind of laying the landscape for how we think our political system may operate going forward. And if the Republican Party is rewarded or given a pass for its current behavior, that's one path we're going to go down. If they're on the receiving end of a bludgeoning, then I think we're going to see a lot of change. We're going to see very likely some challenges within the Republican Party to Donald Trump in 2020. And we may very well see some independent voices and some kind of amalgamation of something or other. So I think um, I'll be in a much better position to answer your question <laughs> in November, although that would be cheating to kind of tell you how it comes out after the fact. Um, but I do think, if you've gathered from what I've been saying, we are at a point of amazing fluidity in American politics. Before the election of Donald Trump three years ago, who would have imagined that one of the major political parties might have gone and done something that is so extreme as to change the two-party system in America? Who would have imagined? So I think the elections do matter. Um, I think the electorate that is forming in this cauldron of Trumpism is and that is coming to political maturity is going to have a huge say in this. I think everyone remembers the first president they voted for and the time they voted for it. And that, to a large extent, people change over time, but it sets for a good long time your political outlook. Sometimes it freezes it in a way that's inaccurate, but it kind of determines you know, which team you want to play on and what you think that team stands for and what you associate when you hear the word Republican. None of the millennials were even alive when Ronald Reagan was president. None of them. 
So they don't know a Republican Party that is cheery and optimistic and, you know, uh, passed what is now called uh, amnesty and, you know, talked about the common man. They don't know that Republican Party. That's as foreign to them as Abraham Lincoln. So it's um, a lot of what the answer to your question is going to be determined by these people. And I have tried to read just about every poll, every survey, every analysis of this generation. And it is really quite a look when you get into the weeds that they are more progressive, but progressive not in terms of party loyalty to the Democratic Party. They don't much care for parties at all. But in terms of belief, in terms of a sense of inclusion, in terms of a sense of globalism, global responsibility, um, it's a very interesting generation that, in my book, has gotten kind of a bad rap. Um, but let's see what they have to say. Um, I think it's going to determine a lot. OK, we've got six minutes. I've got six people on the list. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to declare that we can go a little bit, a couple minutes past two, if that's all right sure. with you. And I'm going to ask for a, a lightning round of, um, this is Executive Ed Grandeisman at work. I'm going to ask for a lightning round of very concise questions, starting with Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Papinski from Cornell. Um, so you answered some of my question, which was a something's changed question about whether or not there's uh, change on the horizon. And so I guess the alternative way to think about this is if, if this isn't an ar an, uh, uh, a harbinger of massive change in party realignment uh, and new partisanship, is it what does America look like in five years if what has emerged is essentially a, a white nationalist Republican Party uh, against a broad coalition of cosmopolitans, minorities, liberals, and Wall Street. Okay, uh, Fida. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your principled stands, and I think this is something that all of us, no matter what our citizen engagement, um, need to keep in mind because the occasions are going to come for all of us, no matter what our political affiliations are, where we have to break from the herd. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that this weekend, uh, the Attorney General and the Assistant Attorney General are going to be fired. If that happens, what should people do? That was concise. OK. Um, <laughs> Rick Vallely. Oh, yeah, right. Well, actually, uh, uh, Peter scooped me. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to know what, uh, what you make of uh, the Attorney General assuming, and the uh, Deputy Attorney General assuming they survive the weekend. That is to say, uh, does Sessions have a commitment to the rule of law? On the one hand, he's very bad on civil rights and on immigration, but on the other hand, uh, he's, he's endured uh, insult and criticism, and there must be something that he's doing inside the DOJ to manage it and to sustain morale. So I was just wondering if you knew anything that other than what we might guess. Okay, huh? Sid Milkus. I'm just blown away by Peter's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just, just a, a real quick comment on your third parties. We've never had an, an enduring multi-party system, but third parties have played a, a major role in, in transforming Absolutely. politics. The, the Republican Party was first a, a third party, uh, and, and the Progressive Party was a third party that had a lot of influence, in particular, particularly on the um, the political institutions. But real, real quick about the courts, I was reading my, my students a quote about from Lincoln the other day about you can't rely on the courts to resolve your major issues. That's turning over your democracy to an eminent tribunal. And I wonder if, if how much faith we can really have in the courts, particularly in the aftermath of what went on with Merrick Garland uh, and, and the kind of pushing of, of, of Neil Gorsuch on okay, the courts. Good. Okay, and then Ron, last question. Hi. Um, I think I can Ron Herring, Cornell. Just a quick question. Could you talk? I appreciate very much your, your comments about the Never Trumpers. Could you say something about what that, what that non monolithic and diverse coalition of Never Trumpers looks like ideologically? In other words, if they were to be part of some kind of new coalition with uh, the reasonable people in the room, what, um, what would be the fault lines? What would be the, is there a wall between you guys and, and the Democrats? And what would be a, a deal breaker? I mean, is it single payer? It doesn't seem like socialist describes much of what the Democratic Party's up to, but is there a line that you would call socialism or is it identity politics that 
reach some level that you would find objectionable. Okay, you got all that? A couple questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, you're a, uh, like, so a you know. question about sort of what does the party future look like um, if, we, if we don't go the third party route and we end up with these two uh, polarized parties, as Tom described, um, fault lines among the never Trumpers and sort of potential amalgamation with some Democrats, um, independent courts, and then I think the big one, um, what happens if the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General are fired? Okay. Right. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. That, that's a COVID. And do you have a bunker that we can yes. all come live in? Um, yeah, right. I think all hell does break loose. Um, and I think uh, there are progressive groups that very much intend to put people in the streets to peacefully protest. And um, you can actually go online. Um, Citizen Project or Citizen Protest, I think it is. Um, I. In my Twitter feed, I think I referenced it, and I had a post that included it. So look it up. Join the peaceful march near you. We'll move uh, on. Pardon? Move on. And move, move on is part of the, the coalition that's putting it on. Right. So number one, I think there's going to be a huge hue and cry. Number two, I think it depends upon what happens to Mueller in that scenario. In other words, do those people disappear, or is this a, just a prelude to Mueller disappearing? In other words, what, what's the next step? If the next step is to elect or to nominate some hack who tells Mueller he's not doing any of this stuff, then we have our constitutional crisis. Um, if he peculiarly would nominate someone who's an independent voice who says, I'm not going to do anything about Mueller, then perhaps nothing much happens. Um, but I do think that would be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, I think at this point, Republicans, first of all, there's something like the prospect of losing to have them rediscover their aversion to Donald Trump. Um, and particularly if they lose badly in November, they'll be you know, through with him. Um, so I think it is entirely possible um, that that does set off the chain reaction. It also depends upon whether it happens before the election or after the election. If it happens before the election, the Democrats may wind up with 90 seats in the Senate. I don't think they can, actually, because there's not that many seats up. But um, <laughs> I think um, but the, the result may be a huge uh, majority, in which case um, we're then down the road of impeachment and the like. All right. So uh, what were the other ones? Um, there was party, sort of party polar, continuing party polarization, white nationalist party versus cosmopolitan oh, party. Right. What does that look like? Independent courts? and right. a little more on the never Trumper as right. sort of fault lines with the right. Democrats. Okay. In, in right. four minutes. In four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Independent courts. There's a difference between enforcing constitutional norms and deciding issues of social policy. And we can have another two-hour lecture on that. But I think we have to distinguish between uh, issues that are um, line drawing between federal and state power, between the executive branch, and wading in to create um, substantive law on issues that could frankly be handled <coughs> by legislative um, players. Um, next issue is polarization. Um, I think if the result is that you have this really shrunken Trump uh, core, and everybody else is in some kind of democratic coalition, you will have a very lopsided political system, not unlike the New Deal, actually, um, for the foreseeable future, until the Republicans decide, oh, hell, we're never going to win an election again, and then decide to migrate back towards um, a more traditional role. Um, but I think it's entirely possible that they could screw this up so badly that you do have a period of really pretty solid democratic rule, which brings me to your question, would that be so bad? Um, I don't know that there is one dividing line. Um, certainly single payer is not something that I or many of my never Trumpers um, are very enthused about. Um, I think there is one issue that is an overriding concern for almost all people in the never Trump camp, and that is a robust foreign policy based on American values. Um, and that, that has been a common theme um, for all of us. Um, that means not only you don't recede from the world, but you also um, have a preference for democratic peoples and democratic governments. Um, what was the next one? Um, that is that it? Did I get it all? Uh, you got it all. Was there something else? Did I miss anybody? Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Well, great. I, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking you, Jennifer, for a really stimulating talk. Thank you. That was great. That thank was you. really, really wonderful. Yeah, my colleague.